Kia ora. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. So goes the refrain of Maya Angelou's poem. We need friends, company and connectedness, particularly when the storms of loss, fear and violence batter at our doors. Water creeping in through the cracks that we didn't know of, wind shaking our foundations, rattling our security. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. Spirituality is about connectedness. It's a relationship word. It's about the connection between our essence, who we are, and the essence of all life and being. So it's about befriending ourselves. The bits we like, the bits we don't. It's also about befriending that which is beyond ourselves. People, environment, little things and big, seen and unseen. And in the befriending of the me, the we and the beyond, they are brought together in order to warm each other, engage and empower each other and celebrate the innate goodness and potential of life. Alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. This spirituality called befriending requires something of us. It requires us to move, to leave the familial and tribal our religion, race and boundaries, through which we know ourselves and survive. To leave in order to embrace a bigger home, a more universal consciousness. So like Abraham, whom we've been reading about in church recently, we leave our familiar land, neighbour and gods to go beyond, to engage other neighbours, foreigners, and their gods, to be tested and tried by anxiety and loss, in order to question and expand what we know, who we know, and why some of our values fall away and some become more important than ever. This is the journey towards wisdom. Many of us recognise this journey. It might not be a physical journey, but it's a journey of the soul. The journey is about leaving much of what is familiar, but it's also about coming home to ourselves, befriending ourselves, and finding once again in this stage of our life the importance of friendship. As we've read and heard these stories of Abraham, I've invited us, following the insights of Karen Armstrong and other scholars, to question the God who is talking to or instructing Abraham. For the Bible is full of different gods or different understandings of God, if you like, each many conflicting with each other. Think, for example, of the contrast between the imperatives to be hospitable to strangers, like Abraham was to the three at uh, the Oaks of Mamre. And elsewhere, though, in Scripture, the imperative to kill foreigners, like Joshua's genocidal ways when he came into the Promised Land. And in a similar way, we too today must sift, discern, the gods on offer. There are gods that value obedience above all else. I would suggest that such gods have a feudal mindset and want subjects, not friends. And those who follow such gods 
seduced by those gods' ethics, often justify power structures that use coercion and bullying. Then there are gods who seem to prioritize their own adoration through tributes, offerings, and grandeur above the well-being of the poorest human communities. And those who follow such gods often justify the privileging of ecclesiastical elites in the corridors of power. And there are gods who believe that the ends, let's say eternal life, justify the means, say sending their son to die. And those who follow such gods seem to justify all manner of dubious and destructive behavior for the greater good. When gods like these are what religions promote explicitly and implicitly, it is no wonder that many take leave of God. Which is why we need to be very wary of the text for today. The attempt by Abraham, under orders from his deity, to kill his son Isaac as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. We need to ask hard questions of Abraham, of his God. Firstly, let us recognize that the killing of firstborn sons was not uncommon in ancient Palestine. There's a reference in the Bible to a Moabite king killing his elders, and Ammonites and Arameans doing likewise. Unless you think it wasn't a Hebrew practice, King Ahaz and Manasseh did so too. There's a suggestion in the King Saul saga that he considered killing Jonathan after a defeat at the hands of the Philistines. There's also a reference to King Solomon condoning child sacrifice. Let us recognize too that such practices are also criticized in the Bible. For example, by Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and not least Micah. Indeed, some argue that the text today from Genesis 22 is part of the rebuttal and discontinuation of child sacrifice. Though if it is, it's a mixed message at best. I say not least Micah, for he criticized not just human sacrifice, but animal sacrifice. I read chapter 6, verse 6, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. I would suggest that Micah has a quite a different understanding of God from many writers in the Hebrew Bible. Rather than a fixation on one's sins and failings and the appeasing of a deity who would likely extinguish you due to one's sins and failings, and the appeasing of such a deity by offering something dear to you, like a son, or a lamb, or goat. Micah takes the focus off the individualism inherent in this understanding. Micah, and I would suggest some 700 plus years later, Jesus, has a God who is known in and through acts of justice, kindness, and being earthed, which is a translation of humility. This is a very different notion of God than that in our reading today. 
Secondly, let us recognize that the text for today, Genesis 21, 1 to 14, to use for this Tribble's phrase, is a text of terror. It justifies the violence of a father towards his son. It justifies the planning, the deceit, the tying up, and the horror of holding a knife over his head. It justifies the notion of a deity, the Judeo-Christian deity, no less, could require of a believer to take their child and threaten or indeed kill them. It is a terrible text. And no number of scholars and preachers with their commentaries and sermons can make this sow's air of violence towards a child into a silk purse of commitment to God. For, as we well know, asking a person to demonstrate their faith and commitment to God by threatening to kill or killing a child can never, ever, ever be justified in any time, culture, or circumstance. And unfortunately, this text justifies such violence. Thirdly, let us recognize that something has happened to Abraham. Four chapters back, as I spoke about last Sunday, he was the man, standing up to a murder-intent deity, asking that deity again and again in the name of justice to stay his violence if there be anyone righteous in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham is fearless, persistent, and faithful to a spirit of justice and compassion rather than to the judgment of an omnipotent deity who is offended by human failings. So, where now is this Abraham? Why isn't he telling the deity where to go, where to get off? Why isn't he defending his son? Oh, why, oh why, Abraham, aren't you defending your son? Isaac, he who was alone, all alone, so trusting, so defenseless, so abandoned, so all alone. There's something very core, very basic to being a parent. You are there as long as you are able to protect your child in order that they may come to find their own strength, resilience, and way in life. No matter what your child's abilities and inadequacies, no matter what your abilities and inadequacies, your child has a right to be protected and you have a responsibility to protect them even though it may cost you dearly. Philip Colbertson has written about Abraham's relationship with his sons Ishmael and Isaac and likens it to a man Today, who has a family with one son, then divorces, and then has a second family and another son. The man must work out how to treat each son justly and fairly, and manage the agendas of his former and current wives. Cobson further suggests that in failing his first son, Ishmael, killing his love for Ishmael, as Culberson graphically puts it. Abraham lost his ability to love Isaac as well. Abraham became emotionally paralyzed. Abraham's story indicates this. After Mount Moriah, the whole story starts to peter out. God goes silent on him. Sarah dies, some legends say, of a broken heart after hearing what happened at Mount Moriah. 
As for Isaac, his story is short, all of four chapters. He does not speak again until his deathbed. He's silent. His father has to take the initiative in finding a wife for him. He has no direct interactions with the deity. There is, for example, no offering of hospitality to the divine, like with Abraham, or Stouchers, as they argue over ethics with the divine. And neither are there divine epiphanies, like his son Jacob would experience at Peniel. The most notable thing about the Isaac chapters is how he messes up the blessing of his two sons. And like his father before him, sets up an animosity between the boys that would endure. Tellingly, very tellingly. In Genesis 31 verses 42 and 53, Isaac's God is referred to as the fear. The fear. It's clear Isaac was deeply traumatized by what happened on Mount Moriah and spent the rest of his life avoiding this fearful God and emanating the errors of his father, Isaac never recovered. Who can blame him for taking leave of this God? And we too need to leave gods like this, deities who want and prize obedience, director gods who determine who live and who dies, who lives in prosperity, who lives in poverty, who gets to be privileged? Who gets a car park? God with favorites and unfavorites. I suggest in taking leave of such gods, we follow the route that Micah pointed to all those years ago. And journey towards an understanding of the divine, not as an omnipotent being desiring to be obeyed and worshipped but a divine spirit known in our relationships, our connectedness with each other and all life, a spirit of equity and kindness, relational, a divine spirit that is literally friendship, a God that is literally love, a spiritual presence that is literally among, between and within us. And a God, too, that weeps over the tragedy and traumas of our text today and the damage it has done and continues to do.